for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Cook. I'm with CSU Extension in Gilpin County. And this webinar is made possible by a cooperation with a few CSU Extension offices, um, Jefferson County, Clear Creek County, Summit County, and Gilpin County. So our organizers um, and your local contacts are Mari Johnson from Jefferson County Extension, um, uh, Chris Kraus from Clear Creek County Extension, I'm Jennifer Cook from Gilpin County, and our speaker today is Dan Schroeder from Summit County, he's the director there. Um, before I turn it over to him, I just wanna kind of introduce anyone who's new to webinars here. Um, so Dan's gonna be presenting, and as you have questions, you can type them into the chat box. So if you don't see your chat, you can hover your mouse on the bottom of your screen or the side of your screen and um, a toolbar should pop up and you just click on that chat box and then you can type in your question and hit enter and we'll, we'll take your question. Um, if we catch it throughout the presentation, otherwise we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Um, yeah, this webinar will be recorded as well and available on Gilpin County Extension website in a few weeks. And then finally, I just wanted to make um, an introduction to a few of our local fire and emergency representatives from our counties who are on this webinar, just in case we have any specific local questions. So we have from Clear Creek County Fire Authority, we have uh, Fire Chief Kelly Babion, I hope I have your name right. Um, from Gilpin County, we have Nate Whittington from the Emergency Management Office, and we also have Chris Bondis from Timberland Fire. And then finally, Mari, Mari Johnson from um, Jefferson County Extension. So with that, I think I can turn it over to you, Dan, and you can go ahead and share your screen and get started. That sounds real great, Jennifer. Thank you so much for passing it my way. Uh, good morning. I always say good morning regardless of the time of day. So hopefully you're having a good day so far. And thank you for attending, ladies and gentlemen, our wildfire preparedness webinar, Zoom meeting. It's uh, real nice to see that there are so many folks interested in this topic, topics of great importance. And so uh, we're just without much further ado, going to get into what I think of very much as a story. So my screen is sharing right now, and if there are um, any issues, maybe we could uh, toss that into the chat. But right now it looks like we are sharing successfully. And so the driver behind all of this is the Ready, Set, Go program. It's a really easy way to internalize what to do in advance of a wildfire. And, you know, our, our nation and the world has been challenged with an issue I would say it's, it's a new issue, a uh, global pandemic. And so this new issue doesn't set aside all of the previous issues we were working on. And so thank you once again for coming to this wildfire webinar. Things like wildfire may be superseded by the COVID pandemic, but we have to remain diligent and recall that all of these other issues that are always swirling around didn't stop just because of what's currently affecting us. So we're gonna move forward. And um, under this Ready, Set, Go premise, I really believe that creating defensible space or doing some uh, vegetation modifications on your property are a really great way to engage in physical distancing, outdoor, healthy, recreational activities. So with that said, I'm Dan Schroeder. I sit in the Colorado State University Extension Office in Frisco, Colorado. and um, in reporting to the Summit County Board of County Commissioners. I work very closely with our Wildfire Council and administer the county's prevention efforts in conjunction with many other entities. So, but let's get to this, this premise here, is that we can't expect someone else to do it for us. This issue needs to be addressed at a one-on-one -on -one level. And when everyone engages, we all have the uh, better outcome where communities are protected. So let's think about these various hazards that are prevalent, maybe not necessarily in our world, but very much so um, in other parts of the country in the world. Of course, many of these hazard profiles are indeed ours, and we need to be aware of the fact that they exist 
and ready to react when they cause an issue for us. The most recent worldwide pandemic is occurring. Um, hopefully you're internalizing because you can see me in this presentation and we don't necessarily have a dialogue going on, but each of these hazard profiles that have come up uh, may have hit you in one way or another in your life, and hopefully you're just thinking those two right now. And the one we're focusing on is this wildfire prevention component today. So I'm gonna take us on a, a trajectory across a storyline, and um, this storyline takes us from the past to the current day. And it really is trying to address what is it that is our issue but why do we have this wildfire issue pressing us today? And um, I'd like to start out with a few myths. We may have heard this at gatherings or other events, and then next thing you know, it does happen. The picture of the big brick building in the background is the Summit County High School. So uh, these buildings are just adjacent to the high school and they survive. But the fire gets awfully close. How about this one? You know, it's something that occurs elsewhere. If I'm sitting in Summit County or you're sitting in Jefferson County, you may say Grand County, where YMCA of the Rocky is, is isn't my issue because it's way over there. But political boundaries don't have any say when it comes to wildfire and its spread. It's a good example of defensible space here. Work had been done prior to this wildfire, and none of these structures were lost. How about this? You live too high, whether you're a mile high in the front range or if you're at two miles high in some of our mountainous communities, we may have stated that our altitude doesn't support wildfire. And indeed, we've got another instance. Things are starting to get a little anomalous here as well when it comes to wildfire. Uh, fire starting in the late afternoon, not typical or what, what used to be typical. We're finding atypical is the current state when it comes to wildfire and behavior. Again, we have houses very close to this wildfire in Keystone, thankfully not lost. I was at a, uh, at a campfire, and a friend of mine was talking about how there's not enough oxygen. Goodness gracious, friends, take a look at the campfire that we're sitting around. Or if you've ever had a birthday cake with a birthday candle on top, right? Fire does have enough oxygen to burn. And uh, we see that again and again throughout the mountains. So what's troublesome with a fire north of Silverthorne, this one, for instance, the Brush Creek Fire, is uh, this point of origin component. So with our fuel type, um, with currently much in the way of heavy fuels close to the ground, they end up burning for a long period of time. And this picture is uh, hotter, uh, sterilizing the soil, and uh, creating a hydrophobic situation. So our outcome after a wildfire with a modified fuel component, like these heavy timbers laying down on the ground, having fallen down after disturbance, uh, it, it can create a far worse effect after the fact. So if the soil is sterilized, no seeds are coming, no seeds are gonna be able to grow. And if it's a hydrophobic, that means the water will run right over the top take the carbon material with it and deposit that into our freshwater surface water streams. That's no good for any of our communities. On the, in Jackson County, and by the way, if you've noticed the dates, we've been moving progressively towards present. This burned for a long period of time a few summers ago on the Colorado-Wyoming border. Uh, how about, how about uh, an area that seems somewhat immune? Here we are back in Summit County to the left is the Breckenridge ski area. And we had the peak two fire in 2017. It's really great when air resources are available, um, but we've got this tourist hub in the center of Breckenridge and a wildfire burning right beyond. So it tells very quickly how our economy could be hurt by wildfire. How about in wilderness, Silverthorn? You say uh, this fuel break that the Forest Service cut a few years ago, 10 years ago or so, it's a 300 foot fuel break. Uh, away from the building, saved a billion dollars of assessed real estate value. And you can see in the upper right corner, maybe heading towards three o'clock, that portion of the subdivision is rather pink. Those homes were hit with retardant. And um, well, this was touted as a success. So when we do fuel mitigation, modifying 
the vegetation around our communities, it does show to be beneficial in saving those communities. How about, how about the East Slope counties? Our Clear Creek Fire Crews, Gilpin Crews, Jeffco Crews, and beyond Boulder County and all the surrounding resources uh, are here to lend support when needed. And again, Evergreen, Bedroom Community to Denver, this is all uh, somewhat problematic when we get into this situation where it is longer, hotter, and drier. So uh, a few more statistics for you here in this MIPS component overview uh, is, is a matter of fire, fire, fires do occur. And sadly, when we look way back at the um, Storm King fire in 1994, a number of firefighters' lives were lost. That's the worst case scenario. And we often talk in prevention about saving life, property, and infrastructure in um, that order, life being the first. But we're progressively, year by year by year, beating the previous year's record, which is not a good thing. Uh, we're, we're having more loss of uh, infrastructure of communities, uh, the dollars to replace this loss are going up. It's becoming more and more expensive. And um, this really isn't something we should be striving for. And we have the power to protect our communities. And so that's really where we're headed. Um, knowing this, uh, CSU has shared that it's really 87% of the wildfires. So we have to round that up. Uh, many are, are human caused, most are human caused, and then we have lightning. But ultimately, wildfire is an issue that we need to continue to keep at the forefront. So as I continue down this story of what brings us to where we are today, in a um, many of the communities and the folks on this call are living in a fire return interval ecosystem. And there are a number of factors that go in to creating this story. And so really when, when I have this slide up here, um, weather and climate, that's all tying into our drought component. We have disturbance, which is biotic, living things. We know that we have insects milling around on the landscape all the time, and we also have abiotic disturbance, and that's non-living disturbances like fire being the next bullet. And all of this makes a difference or means something because we have our, our way of defining it. People are involved here and it's our emotional state. And I, because it affects us and it affects our understanding of, this, of the environment and our place in it, it becomes uh, an issue of concern. So we're just gonna jump right into this first bullet, which uh, I really like to point out that weather is often what we see out the window today. And I can look out the window here and look up at the mountains above the Breckenridge ski area, or we know that tomorrow Arapaho Basin is going to open. I see snow, and I may, might be one of those people that say, oh, there's snow on the ground, we're good, as far as precipitation goes. But that's a snapshot in time today, right now. In fact, uh, on my lawn, it snowed about four inches yesterday. And I could say, all right, we're, we're plenty hydrated, right? Um, but that's a snapshot in time. So yesterday, my yard was hydrated. But over time, we have a different component, different scenario here. Currently, we are in a drought. It's a persistent drought. And um, you know, the drought.gov site gave me the statistics that I wanted to put up for us to remind us that in Colorado, about uh, 30 or a third percent of all of the people in this state are currently living in a drought or an abnormally dry condition where the average expected precipitation has not been attained. And uh, these, these pins in the yellow section there are, are the four extension offices uh, that are on this call here. I'm in Summit County, that's furthest west or on your screen, that's to the left. And then we've got uh, Clear Creek, Gilpin, Jefferson County, down the lane. And you can see that all of our counties have been sitting in this band of abnormally dry. We're not receiving the expected average precipitation currently. And you can see further south in the state of Colorado, we have a severe drought to an extreme drought. I mean, um, much of our state has not received enough precipitation. Even if you look out the mountain, out the window and see the mountains and realize that they're covered in white, we need to look at a, a bigger snapshot. And so I also think it's really important that when you look at these maps, 
you need to recognize that it's a snapshot in time. The top right corner of this map says May 19th, that's effectively now, uh, 2020. Snapshot in time today. And you can see Colorado, and if you find the Colorado River, it's really the blue line traveling from the north central part of Colorado west. And the very tip starting point, the headwaters of that blue line, that's effectively Kremlin, Grand County. And so the yellow band is right there, and that's effectively where we counties uh, reside. But there we are, snapshot today. We're in a long-term drought and a short-term drought throughout the intercontinental west. And I'm gonna take us back to January of 2020, about four months prior, and show a very similar component throughout the southwest in the Four Corners area. Um, exceedingly, we've got moderate and severe dryness, right? Uh, but, but these are snapshots, once again, of just 2020, the last four months. I'm going to take us on a little progression backwards in time now, and we're going to go look at January of 2019. Are we getting better, right, like this? Are we staying the same? Are we still in bad shape? Well, you can see. So we've got a year's worth of not receiving enough precipitation. The white part of the map, by the way, has received at least average. So um, continuing to look a year prior to that. So we went from 2020 to 19. Now we're in January of 18. I just went ahead and chose January's across the board as we go backwards. Um, move this along a little bit. In 2017, the east slope is quite a bit drier than the west in Colorado. The maps change size uh, a little bit as we go through my presentation. So I just wanted you to continue to follow. It's, so it seems in 16, we did receive, for the most part, uh, at least the average amount of precipitation. But that was a snapshot in time. We continue to add up the cumulative effect over time. And, and on this slide, we're at February, you know, that early part of the year of 2014. And instead of taking us through all the years individually, I'm going to draw us back 10 years. We're going to do a hopscotch further back to 2004. So if you take these maps and overlay them from 2004 to 2020, minus that 2016 year, every single year there was a good percentage of the landscape in Colorado and throughout the West, in fact, that had not received the average amount of precipitation. Our soils are dry. Whether or not it's white outside on the hillsides or if it rains today, please remember that if this is a story over time and our, our forests and the natural resources in the landscape are changing over time and weather, climate, temperature has a lot to do with that. Let's jump into some of the biotic factors that create a disturbance on the landscape. Um, this guy, another species type, hitting different species of vegetation. And so these biocontrols uh, help modify the landscape. And I often like to think of nature finding balance, looking for equilibrium. And in the past, the bark beetles were pinned as being destructive and evil and these villains on the environment. But in fact, you know, 100 years ago or so, the miners came through, trappers, miners, um, westward expansion, and they used the natural resource at hand, wood, to create civilization. So much of our vegetative landscape was cut down. We disturbed the forest 100 years ago. So now our trees are all about 100 years old and the bark beetles are real interested in overwhelming and ultimately killing old trees. So we have this progression. Many of you have seen it, but I'm just reminding us of the story. So we're going forward in time once again. Uh, and this is a picture of how the insect pest is killing or hastening the demise of old trees across the landscape. So the maps are about to change again, but I keep our circle in our zone of four counties, Summit County to Jefferson County. And we can see in 2012, a lot of this insect forest disturbance starts to fall away a little bit. I jump a few years again to 2014, and we see that um, instead of the red mountain pine beetle being so prolific across the map, that population crashed. Maybe they had eaten the majority of trees they were interested in. But we do have spruce beetle in the southwest corner. And we do have subalpine fur decline going on in our zone. So we know that change is the only constant. Insects across the landscape have a job to do. And they're always active. Um, when we jump one more screen, slightly different map again, bottom right corner shares that this is 2019 date data and there's a uh, very little insect activity 
in our zones, these four counties currently from a year ago to this year. Uh, but we, we are concerned still because there's a lot of activity in the forest surrounding our counties. And that's important to know uh, in this story of climate and biotic disturbance. And now we have some abiotic disturbance that is something to consider. Uh, wildfire on the landscape is really good for nature. It is a cleaning mechanism, if you will. It's uh, this disturbance that helps, you know, proliferate future forests. Uh, seeds have an opportunity to germinate and uh, different chemistry goes on in the soil after a wildfire. And a lot of the understory and the brush and overstory, in fact, uh, get cleaned out. So this is a good fire, right? It's, uh, it's milling around low on the ground. And of course, these days, we will always put our eyes on fire and make sure that it is behaving uh, if, if there's such a thing. Uh, but when we get into a forested component that's like this, where we have our fine flashy fuels low to the ground, and then we have our heavy fuels having been modified, this landscape modified by um, probably drought. These trees didn't have the ability to push out an insect invasion, and then that occurs, and they ultimately lose their grip on the soil, a uh, shallow rooted lodgepole system, and they jackstrap. We end up with a, with a situation like that, leads us to a graphic like this, where we're uh, not really in such a good shape anymore. And we end up with ground fire, uh, spotting, we know that embers can travel up to a mile or two. And so a landscape that ends up being burned like this is um, somewhat troublesome. But thankfully we have our initial responders who can um, engage. And then ultimately this is a recreation value in that, that was burned, but we felt the trees and uh, the, the trail is safer now than it was before. But um, this is all cause for concern. So let's look forward a little bit. The uh, seasonal fire assessment is showing that our region there, and the Colorado is highlighted in the Southwest, is likely going to have an above normal fire season. This is June, so next month. And the forecast that I was able to look at right here at the NIFSI website, um, pushes us out to July. They didn't have August information yet. Uh, they may have had August. Um, anyhow, this is what I chose to put. And so we can see that throughout this summer, we are once again in a dry environment. We're in an arid environment in Colorado in the first place, um, but we have a lot of fuels on the ground. We have a lot of people on the landscape and wildfire is of concern. And so the people component, and this is your action area. Here's where we're going to look at and talk about how we can engage with the environment that we've chosen to live in and be successful. And so it starts with our partnerships, our wildfire councils, our different agencies and jurisdictions and nonprofits and uh, groups of interested citizens are all very integral in supporting this effort towards protecting communities from wildfire. And uh, in our wildfire council here in Summit County, we, we often talk about COGS. And we have a variety of COGS that all contribute to a whole. And so we think of the largest COGS as the United States Forest Service. In Summit, um, I guess Clear Creek, Gilpin, not entirely sure with Jeffco, but a greater than 50% of the land mass in many of these counties is managed for us, United States citizens, by the United States Forest Service, Department of Agriculture. So they're gonna be the responsible party for doing fuel management projects on the largest land tracks. I'm gonna jump back one slide and just point out that I've got the Forest Service in there twice. And um, that's, you know, to some degree, reminding us that they're a major player and need to be involved in all of uh, our efforts. The red arrow now is pointing at the medium-sized COGS. And those would be municipalities, counties, um, you know, the, the medium-sized entities, landowners, uh, could be school districts that uh, have a part to play here as well. And so that would be treating public lands, uh, county lands, taxpayer -run lands. And then our final cog, I've got a yellow arrow there. It's meant to represent the, the small cogs. And those are to some degree like drops of water, and how it requires many drops of water to create a waterfall. This is all of the private property owners. 
So you can stand on your own private property and think to myself, if I do a fuel mitigation project, defensible space, thinning, it's not going to do much because I'm just one small parcel in this sea of suburbia, um, rural mountain community, wherever you may be. But in fact, if we can get all the small cogs to do their part as well, we end up with a contiguous fuel modification throughout communities. And that is what we see protects communities. So those uh, very easily to grasp large, medium, and small cogs really explode out into all kinds of parts and pieces. And this gets us into the nitty gritty of all the things that you can do as actions to protect your property and your neighbor and your community from wildfire. So, uh, you know, big part of this is buy-in. We had some quantum shifting in the last decade or so, really two decades. Um, and this was a matter of, in the previous days, we would encourage people, and this is uh, municipal codes and land use and development and building codes that would basically make people leave all of the trees where they were and readjust your house footprint to fit into the forest and hide behind the veil of trees. And these days, with FireWise premise and Ready, Set, Go, um, fire adapted communities, we're all looking at the forest a little differently and recognizing that we can just, we can push the forest back from our built environment and yet remain in a forested community. We can still enjoy being in the intercontinental Rocky Mountains uh, and protecting ourselves. We don't have to hide our homes behind the veil of the trees. So what we need to do with local partnerships, we need to figure out an approach. What are we gonna do? I mean, you can just kind of spin or you can make a plan. And this plan is built into many of our communities, community wildfire protection plans, which are great guides to keep us on track towards a fuel reduction community protection effort. Uh, we found in Summit County, tracking and sharing our successes was pretty important. And that led to a, an award, a national award that Summit County received for our chipping program. Uh, in 2020, we're starting our seventh season of doing this, but in the first few years, right off the bat, we tracked every home that participated and volumes of wood, and that became a huge component of our story and how buying in and being part of a proactive community is the better choice. So when we go through this progression, we want to, well, it's important that we accept the fact that we chose to move to a place where fire lives also. Just because humans are now here doesn't mean fire goes away. It's still here. And so we have to accept that fact. But now we evaluate our land, identify things we can do, and move into some action. Um, so the fire triangle is very familiar to most of us. Uh, but the premise here is that if we were to remove any one of these three major components, we will be able to suppress fire. And it's difficult to remove oxygen. And once the heat's in place, there it is. And when we move into summer, it's just a naturally warmer environment, but it's the fuels. We can modify the fuels. And the fuels are not only the vegetative landscape, but it's also our dwellings. It's our built environment as well. Uh, so we have to keep all of those things in mind. So let's, let's jump into some reduction of the flammable vegetation and then the home part that I mentioned a minute ago. Um, what is hardening? Uh, given that we have people in uh, various rural communities on this call today, and I didn't want to play around with internet speeds and video and that kind of thing, we're just going to leave today's presentation as a PowerPoint. But I did want to invite you to investigate some YouTube clips after this presentation. And the title here, Your Home Can Survive a Wildfire, is one that you might choose to take down and go to YouTube after this presentation and take a look. This is a 13 minute video uh, supported by research showing how wildfires uh, are in fact manageable when it comes into communities. And the main premise here is that within 100 feet of a structure, the fuels need to be minimized. That is a threshold distance of a flaming front towards the structure. If we can get about 100 feet of fuel break between the flames and the home, 
homes stand a greater chance of survival. But the next really big thing about this is it's identified that embers are indeed cast from the flaming front into the neighborhoods. And more often than not, embers are the reason homes succumb to a wildfire and burn down. So we're gonna try to minimize ember intrusion coming up. Good video to check out. This graphic is a new representation within the last year about defensible space. You may have heard previously, we often talked about zones one, two, and three. The first zone was 30 feet from the drip line of your house, or let's just say 30 feet out from your house. And that was really minimizing the amount of vegetation within 30 feet of your home. And then we would go 70 more feet. So to take us out 100 feet from your home would be zone two, and that's thinning creating clusters of trees that stand alone in a park-like environment, islands, if you will, across the landscape. And then from 100 feet out to the property edge is zone three, and that's where the forest would be feathered and um, encouraged to kind of become more naturalized. Well, that graphic has been further modified with the most recent research about ember showers and the immediate zone, it's what we really want people to focus on right now, the first five feet from your home. If you're able to pull grasses and leaves and needles out of the zone five feet from the home, you greatly diminish the opportunity for embers to catch a hold of a flammable item and then real slowly burn your house down, maybe under your shingles, sort of from within, and you don't even realize it's happening because it's so small. So of course, intermediate and extended zones are uh, creating a park-like environment towards feathering out to the property line. Another way to look at the same idea of fuel reduction and pushing the forest away from our structures is this graphic here. At the very bottom, you'll see a red, orange, and blue. And that first five feet we're finding more and more is the most critical. Of course, pushing out to 100 feet as best we can. So another YouTube video that I'm not gonna dive in today, um, just the first three minutes is, is really where the most important things go on. This video has us walking around a home with the two homeowners, and there's a four person fire crew, and they're, they're really just um, more like landscaping crew, and they're, they're cutting trees down and minimizing shrubbery. And it's important to think about the flashy fuels, our grasses, all the way up to the heavy fuels, which would be uh, stems, whole trees. And they're mowing. And they're pulling those weeds that have grown out of the drip rocks from underneath the fascia of the house, within the five feet, right? Um, also, if you think of a, I often think of a river, and we, we know there are calm spots on the sides of rivers where the water swirls, and it flows backwards against the main river body flow. We call that an eddy. Eddies occur in the air as well. And in fact, when I think of skiing, the ski patrol put fences on the hillside uh, to create a pressure differential, and which in turn creates an eddy. And so snow will compile or you know, pile up in certain areas where ski patrol would like to see that occur. Um, so once again, getting back to the house, if you walk around the perimeter of your house, you're gonna see places uh, probably sheltered places that are depositories of leaves, needles, flammable vegetation that have gotten there through wind. And those are your vulnerable, spot, vulnerable spots. The vegetation sitting there is exactly where embers are going to land because they're gonna eddy around your building the exact same way the vegetation did. Identify that, clear out those spots as an absolute priority area. Um, this video, is along those lines. I invite you to watch it after. Of course, we have a number of resources to help people. You can call your local fire district and there's an opportunity to partner with them. Maybe they would send a crew or a few resource specialists out to walk the property with you and give you some ideas on what you can do to minimize your risk. A lot of this is what we're talking about. Um, some communities have government programs, whether they be grants or cost share, uh, I know that the Summit Association of Realtors, there's a Colorado Association of Realtors as a greater umbrella as well, 
but they are very active in the wildfire conversation. And they oftentimes will offer their real tours out as volunteers into communities. So some things to look at. State Forest Service, of course, manages the Firewise communities, and that's, that's a great way to uh, not only gain recognition, but engage your neighbors and just do some small projects around the community on an annual basis. And then finally, I did look up the homeowner tax credit just a few days ago, and it, it is still live. It's still viable until 2020, current, 2022 currently, and you can get a tax um, deduction of up to $2,500 based on how much money you spend grouped by receipts. And so there's another way that you can, um, you can gain a little bit here. So I'm just gonna buzz through this little case study and it's a matter of if you're a land manager, a county worker, someone in the fire district, someone who may have a, an elected official that you can converse with and get some policy in place, it will make your job of enforcing or encouraging fuel reduction go a little bit further, I think. And so all of us have a very similar looking community. We often lead with carrots, but sometimes if we can build it into our codes, um, building codes, land use codes, if we can create some uh, land protection strategies to keep development from occurring further out, then we can um, really minimize the risk once again by putting all of the density of houses and people in um, more closed in areas. So we can look at all the master planning documents. These are items that we have in Summit County. Um, action plans, multi-hazard mitigation plans. Many of these are already in place. Uh, if we look at the land acquisition, conservation, and TDRs, transfer, transfer of development rights, this is a way that we can strip density off the landscape move the density and somewhat we have a bank and then developers can buy density if they're short in specific areas so we're encouraging the density to stay where we want it and the backcountry or the places further afield to be protected and then of course we have our codes and zoning um, basic things like this are just a very starting point on how we can take what was just carrots and trying to encourage into, into the code and legislative side of things where it's required and um, that will help our communities. In the Land Use and Development Code, this is in our planning kind of side of things, we are um, no longer allowing uh, excuse me, firewood, like in the picture on the right, to be under the house or within 30 feet of the house, in fact, um, from November to May. So basically when there's snow on the ground in Summit County, we allow people to have their wood close to the house because you need to have access to it to keep your house warm but we do have a component that requires people to put their wood piles further away from their house during wildfire season. The same thing with fences. We know that fences can act like a wick and fire can work its way down the fence line to the structure. So we have a new design standard that's our wall and fence design and it needs to be a non-combustible fence within 10 feet of the house or it might be within 10 feet, five feet section, but we do have that in place. And those are things that you all can consider in your own communities. And then subdivisions. We're actually starting to build in a defensible space component at subdivision review. So prior to any structures being created, we're requiring fuel reduction way in advance. So that is helping protect our communities before they even continue to grow. And then some of this outreach. These are more community tools more tools in the toolbox. So these are uh, some of these actions that I really wanted to impress upon here as we reach the conclusion of this presentation or as we get closer. And um, what do you do? How is it that wildfire prevention can be your responsibility? Well, things like your pets, uh, your important documents, your, your kit that has your glasses in it, and your medications. No one else is going to do these things for you. Um, the personal responsibility side here. I, I know in Summit County we have 28 engines, but in our two fire districts at any given time we have seven crews ready to go. So that's our 24-hour availability. Um, the first call we have seven crews on the ground. Now of course our, our um, 
support will be coming very quickly from other communities within an hour or so, right? But the mutual aid is on its way. But initially, just seven engines are ready to roll. So you cannot expect an engine to anchor on your driveway and protect the community from your house. Um, but what you can do is set up your property to be the best case scenario for an engine to park if they come through your neighborhood. You want your property to hail out, park here, because we are your safety zone here on our property. So those are things just to think about. You know, and to reverse all that, we don't want to be the property that burns down the entire neighborhood either. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Uh, what, what have we got here? I see flashy fuels, grass, uh, leading up to a very laddered situation where the tree vegetation is right up against the house. And likely the branches are over the top of this roof line. So we have small trees to medium trees to large trees. The wildfire were to typically start small, right, in the small flashy fuels where it can grab on, and a little bit of wind blows towards this home, it's going to burn down. So we uh, have the opportunity now to identify and go through our checklist of things we can do to mitigate risk. Uh, start with a weed whacker out away from these trees. Maybe choose some of the skinnier, unhealthier looking trees to be removed, where we can create an island of stems or trees with a gap of no vegetation in between. Uh, hopefully this has got an asphalt shingle roof. And then of course, the five feet surrounding, immediately surrounding the building would be important to look at. Um, so an example of a currently not so good situation. We hopefully are ready and we're set and we're able to go. Um, one of the last components I wanted to talk about under this ready, set, go premise is what happens to you when you are a victim of wildfire? Uh, what kind of coverages do you have? These are all really important to make sure to take care of and become aware of prior to a wildfire event. All of this is, is what you ought to do ahead of time. So, um, you know, replacement value. You might have insurance on your property, but is it for purchase value? Well, you bought the home 13 years ago. It certainly has appreciated. Is it replaceable? Um, and these are all real dicey because if your home valuation goes up, your taxes go up. So a lot of people would prefer not to have a current valuation on their home specifically because it, it, it does that retroactive um, cost more on the tax side of things. But I will share the Sonoma fires occurred a couple of years ago and um, my aunt, she's a grandma really, but she did lose her entire home in Kenwood, California. That's in Sonoma County. And um, she had, she had, did not have replacement value insurance. It, and it was something like purchase value insurance. Well, she'd lived in the house for 40 years and it literally is burned to the ground. There's a, you know, the chimney stack is remaining. So uh, she didn't have enough money to rebuild and ended up moving in with Aunt Jane, who was not very excited. So this is all part of the story that you can think about. Um, what do you plan to do after? So uh, thanks for looking at that. Here's, here's another thing that we all can do right now that we all ought to do right now. Uh, as landlines go away or the ability to com communicate enhances, it'd be great if we were all able to be on that enhanced bandwidth. And that's your county's emergency notification system. You can see in Summit what we have up here. Um, Code Red is a big driver for many of the counties throughout the state of Colorado. Zoom in on your county and what it is that your county uses uh, to, to send out notifications in the event of an emergency and sign up. Most of these are self-selected services and they have lots of opportunities for you to check boxes. Uh, I would like to receive information about, I have children in the school district. I would like to know about, the, I'll check the school district box. Um, and of course, my whole zone, but I don't drive to Denver a whole lot. So I may not want to know about the Eisenhower ten, Tunnel East. So I'm not going to check that box. So um, I can choose what kind of information I receive. And I know a lot of this is, is repetitive, but you all on the call know as well as I know that it's an ongoing 
telling of the story. It's really important that we just keep reminding ourselves, especially when the season makes it pertinent. We've already had a few wildfires. I know in Carbondale, there was a wildfire in April, um, took some air resources to put out. And uh, well, front range, we're starting to see some activity all around. And so it's important just to stay on this bandwagon. Uh, the basic kit, I often think it's a plastic bucket. You've got a number of things in it and it's ready to go. Uh, this is incredibly basic. I mean, you would probably want to put a lot more in, um, but it's the bailout bag. And if you haven't thought of it ahead of time, it's going to be a little bit dicey you know, three days later in a shelter in the same pair of underwear. Uh, the likelihood is we, we won't all end up in shelters, but it, it could get bad quickly. You know, and I referenced California fires not too long ago. And a year later, there were still people in tent camps in the Walmart parking lot. So it could get really bad for quite a long time. And any level of kit that you can create is a good move. So um, the go part of it is last, you know, it's our ready, it's our set, and that's our go. If law enforcement issues the order for people to evacuate, it's in your best interest to get out of their way so that they can do your, their job and not worry about you. And um, these are some, some steps for graphic, for graphics, right? You grab your kit, you grab some clothes, embers being the major concern. If you have a mask, we're all wearing masks these days, but of course, uh, long pants, long sleeves, um, sturdy shoes, and your pets. You know, pets aren't pets. Pets are family members. So we need to make sure to take care of everyone, bring everybody with us, and um, hopefully you've done your work ahead of time and you're all ready when and if and when the wildfire makes its way to your doorstep. Thanks so much for participating today. I know that you were invited to post questions and I'd really love the opportunity to answer some questions if there are any. So let's see, ah, you know what, just open. So uh, my presentation's over, but I would, I would dive into some of these questions. Yeah, do you want me to read them to you or do you want to kind of address them? Um, let's see, I'll, I'll address them down below or I'll go for it. Um, I see the first question here, it says, I wonder about another belief while working at a cut above forestry, forestry and if you all have your chat box open, you could read this as well. Um, we had calls about the increased danger from the now gray trees that were once red, right? They were dying. And uh, let's see here. The foresters said they were not as much of a danger. So I, I would like to address that. And it, and it is true. A green forest burns um, quite well, right? So if we've got green needles on the trees and a, a fire comes through, it'll absolutely burn. So that fire danger is pretty high in a green forest. It remains pretty high and maybe even grows a little with a dead forest when the red needles are still on the trees. But as the needles fell, the fire danger decreased. It's absolutely true. If we have standing stems that don't have much material on them to carry fire in a ladder format, the fire danger diminishes. But what happens next, and this is the part we're all very concerned about, is these heavy fuels that may be lodgepole, for instance, are shallow rooted they will lose their grip on the ground, stop drawing up water and be subject to wind throw and they fall down that like that graphic I showed or the picture I showed about the jack straw forest. So now we have heavy timbers up close against flashy fuel and the fire regime or uh, occurrence opportunity or potential and the potential for hydrophobia and scarification, right? Just absolutely burning the landscape goes up. And um, it's this changed fuel type with heavies on the ground is what we're really concerned about. We would never send fire crews into a situation like that because of the danger to human life. So it would really have to be an air show to suppress a wildfire in the jack straw component. Um, so the myth about the pine beetle increasing the fire risk, um, maybe like 10 years later after those dead trees fall down. And there's a lot of research going on. So these answers aren't definitive really trying to figure out how the ecosystem changes. Uh, what do we have here? So there's a question about, um, someone's asking which kind of beetle, which species type prevalence do we see in Ranch LC, Coal Creek Canyon? Uh, I personally don't know. If, if you are on the call and are familiar 
with what's currently active, feel free to answer here in the chat. I, I, I don't apologize, I'm not gonna do that. I often position my own self as someone who has some information and I love to be able to share the information, but I think we can really learn best from each other. And I have to accept right off the bat that I'm not gonna know many, many of the answers, but we can help facilitate our own dialogue with one another. And to get to that question, when you figure out what insect pest it is, then you've got the next set of tools to understand how to manage that in insect pest. And in some cases, it, it may just have to be a hands-off approach. Um, let's see here. So someone suggests that the Summit County uh, Task Force, Wildfire Task Force, we have a number of different groups, Friends of the Dillon Ranger District, Forest Health Task Force, our Wildfire Council, that we may act as a, an example for other counties to do something uh, similar. And grant programs, for instance, we do have a grant program. Uh, it's a cost offset and it's taxpayer funded based on property value. So the grants, real quickly, it's um, for every $100,000 of assessed value on your house, you pay 98 cents in taxes to this wildfire program. Ultimately, it leaves us with about $300,000 to spend in a 50-50 cost share. In the last few years, we, that's our fuel reduction program with the same pot of money, so we're trying to stretch it. We now have a CWPP implementation grant program, and that's for everything other than fuel. So we have six or seven communities where we've installed cisterns to provide wildfire fighting water in non-hydrated communities. And that sliding scale for cost share is about 90-10, if we need it to be. We've improved roads. Um, some neighborhoods didn't have adequate signage. So non-combustible, highly reflective signage is something that we've encouraged with our grant program. So uh, some other things that are going on, and, and if you wanted to reach out to me, my contact info is at the beginning of this slide. I can share how we go about uh, having the folks apply and vetting them through a wildfire council, having a team, a subcommittee that goes through all of the application requests, and then how we determine ultimately who gets funded. Um, let's see here. Jeffco doesn't have a grant program, and we have TABOR restrictions, of course, throughout the state of Colorado. Um, so there's a suggestion that the CSU Extension Jefferson County office has a plant diagnostic clinic, but the office is closed. Pardon me, I'm reading this all out loud. Let's see here. Oh, look at that. It's Mari is telling everyone, thank you, Mari, that you can um, submit pictures to the email address plantclinic at jeffcoda.us for diagnostic assistance. I'm rolling my way down the questions here. So Ips Beetle, um, just wondered if we knew anything in the area. You know, I, what I do know is that uh, Dan West is the Colorado State Forest Entomologist. That was my last map about insect infestation on the landscape. That was the bottom right corner show 2019. Uh, Dan and I were chatting not too long ago and he, he shared that kind of in our zone right now, um, our total beetle activity is about four one hundredths of a percent of the land mass. So how many acres of new active insect pest activity is occurring? And it's nil. It's um, always going to be occurring to some degree, but it's, it's so minimal right now. And uh, as far as Ips beetle goes, I don't know what our outlook is for that. Look at that. Jennifer shared with everyone about what websites to check out about receiving notifications. Reach out to the sheriff's office. You know, someone there can help you. Um, by all means, this is a situation where you're empowered to pursue your own questions. It's really important that you don't wait and let someone else feed you the information. If something is of interest to you, you're not sure, call the cops. They're our neighbors, they're our friends. Um, they're here to help us out. So um, call the fire departments, call your county um, planning commissioner or community development people, your extension agents. You know, we all do what we can to help each other find the answer to our questions. Let's see here. Um, I don't really see frass at the base of the trees, but have new dead lodgepole every single year. Uh, you're right. So you don't see a whole lot of activity of the beetles, but um, 
There are other factors that can kill the trees. So the abiotic components, this would be temperature. If we don't get a very big snow year and the trees aren't protected by that insulating layer, they would be subject to the UV radiation from the sun. And so we are also in this prolonged drought, right? We add all of these environmental components together and the trees are incredibly um, thirsty. And so they're just plain stressed from a lot of different angles. And that could be a component why your trees are succumbing. Often it takes a couple years for them actually to show death, but they may have been in decline for some time anyway. Uh, we have a great deal of mistletoe that is a, to some degree, a viral infection on trees here in Summit County. Uh, let's see here. We will post the links. I just had a couple of YouTube links. Um, but if you were to go to YouTube and type any of those search phrases, like protect your home from wildfire, it's, there's a treasure trove of good videos out there to remind us that we can all do something positive to protect our homes and our communities. Uh, evacuation routes, this is interesting. Once again, you've gotta know where you live and what roads get you out. Uh, the, the first responders pretty well have a grasp of where to send people in the event of an evacuation, but it's often not advertised ahead of time because it depends on where the fire is and which way the wind is blowing. We don't want people to be confused ahead of time if they think their route is north, but on that given day, north is blocked because that's where the wildfire is. So it's uh, situational awareness, it's understanding what your own exit routes are and being able to get out on any one of those. That really falls right back to the individual and don't wait to be told. If there's any concern, just get, right? It's better. Um, that question's come up a few times for me, the five feet around the structure, should we remove all vegetation or just the needles, pine cones, and trees? It's, it's uh, squishy, right? The fire scientists would say, please remove all material within five feet. Uh, you're increasing, you're decreasing your risk. But on the other hand, that's your home. Uh, this is where you live. You may have spent a lot of years propagating those hedges around the building that are quite close to the building. You don't wanna rip them out. That's your prerogative, uh, but you need to know what give and take is going on and what you're willing, what level of risk you're willing to accept. So this is where we break up the fuel continuity. If you've got to have those shrubs close to the building, well then make sure you've got a big gap from the shrubs out and almost to some degree call those shrubs part of the building, part of the structure. Um, so just, just take uh, a good assessment, put on your goggles and, and have a good look and try to determine what it is you'd be okay removing. Um, I've found in Summit doing this work for a while now that uh, people were very concerned about cutting trees around the house, defense of the space. But then eventually they took a few out and saw that their view increased and it didn't diminish their property values, etc. And eventually we lead to this um, sales pitch of embracing glades, vistas, and view corridors. And it turns out we can still live in the forest and not have the trees right up against our home because it's all still out there and we get to enjoy it differently than we once did before. So let's see. I appreciate the thank yous out there. I appreciate the invitation to come and have a chat with you all. Uh, once again, I think it's important that we all recognize the wonderful amount of information that we have within ourselves and our own quiver. And then wherever possible, we can share that information and fill up each other's quiver so that we all recognize and remember that we're in this together. COVID phrase, but it applies across the board. And we can all help protect our communities from wildfire because it takes everyone to protect everyone. What do you think, Jennifer? Would you like to jump in? You know, there's a metal roof question there and um, metal would be considered in the non-combustible side of things. So you say, is it safer or more unsafe? Uh, it's then what? And anything's better than shake shingles. Everything's better than shake shingles. In fact, I think most codes don't, don't allow you to do shingles uh, anymore unless they're a composite material made to look like shingles, but actually aren't. Um, if you have a metal roof and your embers are gonna travel down it, make sure that the gutters are clear. So anyway, thanks Jennifer. Thanks Dan and everyone for joining us. We have one final poll before you leave. Um, hopefully you can 
take that before you sign out. And if you have any further specific questions, please reach out to your local extension office or your local emergency management office. And we can surely help you individually with these questions. Um, I know it can be a little bit overwhelming to look at your property and think about how fire might, you know, act it or, or react around it. So um, please reach out to us and let us know if we can provide any further resources for you. So it looks like um, just about maybe a few more people are still taking the poll, but again, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Dan, for your presentation. Um, some County could be a pretty good resource for, um, at least for Gilpin County as we develop our comprehensive plan and are trying to, you know, come up with better ways to be, um, to protect ourselves from fire in the future on a county scale. So we'll definitely reach out to you as we're developing some of our role, our rules in the future. And yeah, it looks like just about everyone has taken the poll. So thank you very much, everyone. And I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And for everyone who came to this call, thanks so much and have a great summer. Thanks everyone.